Hello friends, welcome to jwreasoning.com. I'm making this video for Sunday, June 2nd, 2024, and the Watchtower study that we're going to be considering is entitled, Avoid the Darkness, Remain in the Light. But before we begin, I just wanted to say, I wanted to thank each and every one of you who reached out and who sent me a message. Thank you very much for your support and your prayers and the loss of my uncle. I really appreciate that. This week has been a whirlwind for me. So I was really on borrowed time trying to get this video done for you. And it's just, it means so much that everybody was praying and the people who sent those nice messages. Thank you very much. And I really, you have no idea how far that goes with just warming my heart, knowing that there are other brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus that know the feeling of losing someone. But I wanted to take the time to make this video. Again, this video is about the Watchtower study entitled, Avoid the Darkness, Remain in the Light. And we're just going to skip to paragraph two. I am gonna make this brief because I'm running on limited time today. So here in paragraph two, I want you to notice, it says, almost 10 years earlier, Paul had spent quite some time in Ephesus, preaching and teaching the good news. He loved his brothers very much and wanted to help them to remain faithful to Jehovah. But why did he write to anointed Christians about darkness and light? I want to stop here because it asks the questions, why did he write to anointed Christians about darkness and light? It's amazing to me how the organization singles out and they make anointed Christians those who are of a special group of this special number that they pick, which they call the 144,000. When Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians, he was writing to that church or congregation. Now, the organization will tell you that all of the first century Christians were anointed. Well, the problem is the organization has hijacked this word anointed. I invite you to look up, do a word search in your Bible on the word anoint, anointed, anointing. And you're going to be surprised at what you're going to find. I hope, I've mentioned this before, I do hope to do a video on that. It's just life gets in the way sometimes and I get so busy. But I will plan to do a video on anointed and what it literally means. And what's happened is the organization has made this specific to the ones that they want to call anointed ones. But when Paul was writing his letter to the Ephesians, he was writing it to the Christian church. This letter would apply to you and me. It, it applies to us. We are all supposed to be partakers. I've covered this in another video. We're all supposed to partake in the bread and the cup. This is something that Jesus said we must do. I'm not going to go into that now, but the problem is the organization limits that. And they say, no, you're not to partake when you go to their memorial. But the fact is, if you're a Christian, and if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that He is the Master, and that He is the only way to the Father, and it's through His shed blood that you get eternal life, then you should be partaking according to the Bible. Read John chapter 6. Read the whole chapter. It starts off in one point, and then it brings you right up through to what Jesus said, what His command was, and who He said it to. Next, in the same paragraph, it says, and what lessons can all Christians learn from this council? So you see, they're separating. The anointed ones, as they like to hijack and call them, are separate from you and me. So it applies not to you, it applies to the anointed one, but by proxy or by trickle down, we can get some benefits from it if we follow the council. This is dangerous thinking, friends. The fact that the organization teaches two hopes. There's one hope, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So keep this in mind. The hope is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And the problem is the organization has split the group. And they did this in the middle of the 20th century, early to middle part of the 20th century. Next in paragraph four, it has a little heading there. It says religious darkness. And then it says, before learning the truth and becoming Christians, the Ephesians to whom Paul wrote were enslaved to false religious ideas and superstitions. Well, this is true. They were living different lives. Most of us have. Many of us come from various backgrounds where we didn't know Jesus, we didn't know his Father, and we were living according to our own will rather than to the will of God. But what I want to point out in this article, in paragraph 4, it says, Before learning the truth 
and becoming Christians. You know, the truth, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, is the organization. According to John 14, 6, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, not an organization. So when we look at this and it says, before learning the truth and becoming Christians, my question for Jehovah's Witnesses is, if the Jehovah's Witness organization didn't exist, until the 19th century, the late 19th century. Actually, the Jehovah's Witness organization didn't exist until the 20th century. But we'll give Russell the credit. We'll go back to 1879, and we'll say that when the Watchtower was established, that's when Jehovah's Witnesses existed, just for the benefit of the argument. But here's the point. How did they become true Christians back then? How did they learn the truth without the organization, if in fact today you must have the organization to learn the truth? You see, they're so hopped up on themselves, they're so caught up in these things, they can't get away from it. So it says there, before learning the truth and becoming Christians, the Ephesians were enslaved to false religious ideas. But where was the organization to teach them these things? It doesn't fit when you start asking questions. Paragraph 7. It says, before we learned the truth, we were in religious and moral darkness. When I look at this paragraph, I think about people who don't know who Jesus is, which Jesus is the truth. And before they know him, they might be doing things that are not according to his will. But notice the paragraph. It says, before we learned the truth, in other words, they're saying found the organization, we were in religious and moral darkness. I know people who have never been Christian, who are, have never been part of any denomination or even any religion for that matter, that live moral lives. But the organization makes this blanket statement that we were in religious and moral darkness. Well, do you have to be a Jehovah's Witness in order to know what morality is? According to the organization, you do. And that's really sad. I know many people who have never been Jehovah's Witnesses, and again, never even been Christian, that live moral lives and live according to the standards that that God holds them to as far as their morality. Next, in paragraph 13, Paul encouraged the Ephesian Christians not only to continue rejecting the darkness, but also to go on walking as children of light. What does that mean? Simply put, it means to conduct ourselves as true Christians at all times. One way to achieve this goal is by diligently reading and studying the Bible. Amen to that. But they can't stop there, friends. They can't stop there. Look at it again. By diligently reading and studying the Bible along with our Bible-based publications. How did those Ephesians ever make out? How did they survive without these publications? How did anybody come to a knowledge of the truth, according to the organization, before 1879 when the first Watchtower article came out? You see, they're following men. They're not allowing the Bible to speak for itself. This is a dangerous place to be, friends, but this is right where they are. They can't make a comment about the Bible without pointing to their publications. You'll, find, you'll be hard-pressed to find anything or any paragraph or any article that says, read and study your Bible, that doesn't point eventually to the organization. Next, in paragraph 17, Paul also counseled the Ephesian Christians to use their time wisely. The wicked one, our enemy Satan, would like to keep us so busy with the world's pursuits that we have no time for our service to God. It would be all too easy for a Christian to put material possessions, secular education, or his career ahead of opportunities to serve Jehovah. Notice how they word this. They say, our enemy Satan would like to keep us so busy with the world's pursuits that we have no time for service to God. I think the enemy does want to keep us from learning about God. But how is the organization any different? Because what they do is they keep you so busy with their videos and their magazines and their literature and in their publications that you don't have time for God. Your time is all used up going to meetings and reading their publications, watching their videos, and bringing people to an organization rather than bringing people to Jesus Christ. This is how it is for Jehovah's Witnesses. They think they're doing a good work. I mean, when I was a witness, I thought I was doing a good 
thing. And I think in some ways I was doing a good thing. And I think many of you are doing good things. But the focus should not be on bringing them into an organization. The focus should be on pointing them to Jesus Christ who points them to the Father. That's it. It's not about that. But the organization keeps people so busy they keep them so wrapped up that you don't have time. That's why they want you to quit your job or get a part-time job and, and do whatever you have to do to work just a few hours a week and bring people to their corporation. This is really what it seems to be all about. It's not about saving lives. It's not about preserving life because if this is what it were about, we'd be pointing them to Jesus. So let's move on to paragraph 19. It says, Paul's letter to the Ephesians must really have helped them in their Christian course. And that inspired counsel can help us too. As noted, it can aid us in choosing our entertainment and our associates wisely. It can motivate us to continue immersing ourselves in the light of truth by having a consistent program of Bible study. I highlighted this because I can't emphasize that enough. Bible study, not publication study. Study your Bibles, friends. I really hope that you will think about these things, that you will consider what the Bible says instead of what the organization says. I want to share a text with you in Acts chapter 4. I've highlighted this recently, but I'm going to start highlighting this more often because I want you to remember these verses, and one in particular. I think this will really help you in your walk. Acts chapter 4, this is Peter. He says, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone, speaking about Jesus, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Those religious leaders were rejecting Jesus Christ. The religious leaders of the Watchtower organization actually reject Jesus Christ, putting themselves in the place of Jesus. They're rejecting the cornerstone, which is Jesus. But notice also verse, I'll read 11 again. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Friends, the organization will not save you. Being one of Jehovah's Witnesses will not save you. The governing body cannot save you. It is only Jesus Christ who can save you. Remember that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except by Him. My prayer for you is that you will continue to study your Bible and that Jehovah will continue to bless you until we meet again.